This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com. I wanted to talk about St. Gregory Nazianzen and his views on baptism, quote, baptism of desire, and infant baptism. As we quoted in our salvation book, St. Gregory Nazianzen, father and doctor of the Church of the 4th century, clearly and repeatedly rejected the concept of, quote, baptism of desire. I wanted to quickly discuss what he said on that matter before covering what he said on infant baptism and its relevance to this issue. In point number 22 of his Oration on Holy Baptism, dated January 6, 381, St. Gregory says, quote, But then you say, Is not God merciful? And since he knows our thoughts and searches out our desires, will he not take the desire of baptism instead of baptism? You are speaking in riddles if what you mean is that because of God's mercy, the unenlightened is enlightened in his sight, and he is within the kingdom of heaven who merely desires to attain it. End quote. As we can hear, St. Gregory could hardly have been more clear in rejecting the concept of baptism of desire. And what's remarkable about this quote is that about half of the defenders of baptism of desire who would write articles in defense of baptism of desire, would argue that St. Gregory Nazianzen did not reject baptism of desire. That's how extraordinarily dishonest they are. And if that quote were not sufficient to prove the point that he clearly and repeatedly rejected baptism of desire, let's consider what he says in point 23. Quote, If you judge the murderously disposed man by his will alone, apart from the act of murder, then you may reckon as baptized him who desired baptism apart from the reception of baptism. But if you cannot do the one, how can you do the other? I cannot see it. Or if you like, we will put it thus, if desire in your opinion has equal power with actual baptism, then judge in the same way in regard to glory, and you may be content with longing for it as if that were itself glory. And what harm is done by your not attaining the actual glory, as long as you have the desire for it? End quote. So, St. Gregory Nazians and Doctor of the Church clearly rejected the concept that the desire for baptism could place the unenlightened in the camp of the enlightened, or the unjustified in the camp of the justified, or the man outside the kingdom, that is, outside the church, inside the church. And in point 23, one of the points we were just quoting from, St. Gregory also says that infants who depart without baptism, unsealed as he calls it, as well as individuals who want baptism but depart without receiving it, will not be glorified. And I should quote what he said to further nail down this point. Speaking of this category of individuals, he says, Others are not in a position to receive it, perhaps on account of infancy or some perfectly involuntary circumstance, through which they are prevented from receiving it, even if they wish. End quote. So he's speaking of infants and people who wish for or desire baptism, yet are prevented not because they put it off through their own fault, but because of some involuntary circumstance. And concerning that category of individuals, he says that they will not be glorified. Therefore, there is absolutely no doubt that in every possible way, he rejects the idea that people who desire baptism, wish for it, can be saved without it. This is very interesting because St. Gregory Nazianzen, not only is he a father and doctor of the church and a significant one, but he is actually the only doctor of the church in history who received the special title of theologian. We see this reported in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Dom Prosper Garanger also says, quote, Gregory the one of all the Gregories who has merited and received the glorious name of theologian, end quote. That's very interesting because there are people in the traditional movement who argue that the support for, quote, baptism of desire among more modern theologians compels Catholics to assent to it. That is an utterly flawed argument, which we've discussed and refuted in the past. It was advanced by Anthony Ciccata, whose argument is completely refuted in section 19 of our salvation book and in a video on our website. Since his position is false and he cannot defend it, it's not a surprise that Jakarta refused our debate challenge. But it's ironic that the one doctor of the church who is given the special title of theologian 
explicitly and repeatedly rejects the concept of, quote, baptism of desire. I don't think that's an accident. Since baptism of desire is really, in many ways, the key to the great apostasy, the belief that you don't need Christ, that you don't need actual incorporation into his body, God, in providing the data needed for Catholics to refute this heresy in the final battle for the faith, would dot all the I's and cross all of the T's. In other words, he foresaw that people would be advancing this false doctrine under the banner of the teaching of theologians. So he made sure that the one doctor of the church formally accorded that title, explicitly rejected, quote, baptism of desire. But the fact of the matter is that most of the early church fathers rejected the idea that an unbaptized catechumen could be saved by his desire for baptism. There's something else that's very interesting to consider in this regard. We often hear from baptism of desire defenders that our understanding of these issues should be derived from the mind of the theologians rather than the actual text of the dogmatic pronouncements. In other words, that the teaching of the church must be found in what the theologians at the time of a dogmatic pronouncement or at the time of a council were thinking rather than what was actually promulgated. Because, they claim, we cannot understand or interpret what was promulgated by the council We must learn it from the fallible teaching of the theologians, and that is clearly false. The pronouncements of the magisterium must be our rule. They must be the final word on these issues. But in analyzing their argument that we must get into the mind of theologians, it's very interesting to consider that St. Gregory Nazianzen was the bishop of Constantinople, and he also played a crucial role at the First Council of Constantinople in the year 381, which is now recognized as the Second Ecumenical Council. And it was in the very same year of the Council of Constantinople, 381, that St. Gregory Nazianzen gave this speech on holy baptism, in which he repeatedly rejects, quote, baptism of desire. His role at the Council of Constantinople is very relevant to this because it was at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 that we have the first dogmatic pronouncement of the truth that there's only one baptism for the remission of sins. The Nicene Creed, which is said at traditional masses, that is actually the Nicene-Constantinople Creed. The original creed at the Council of Nicaea is shorter than what is said at masses today. The creed was amplified or expanded at the First Council of Constantinople. For example, the original creed of Nicaea ended with a single statement about our belief in the Holy Ghost. The expanded version at the First Council of Constantinople included other statements about the Holy Ghost, as well as statements about the Catholic Church, the resurrection of the dead, and the phrase, one baptism for the remission of sins. And even after the First Council of Constantinople, we know that the Filioque Clause and the Son, referring to how the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, was added to what is called the Nicene Creed. The point is that the first time the phrase one baptism for the remission of sins was included in the creed in a council was at the first council of Constantinople where St. Gregory Nazianzen was present. And in fact, at one time he presided over the council and was leading the council. So consider this. The bishop who's leading the first council of Constantinople The council which promulgates the dogmatic definition that there's only one baptism for the remission of sins, in the very same year, gives a speech in which he repeatedly rejects baptism of desire. And in fact, in this oration we quoted from, Gregory is not just rejecting baptism of desire, he's mocking it. He's saying that the idea that desire can replace baptism or bring the unenlightened, the unjustified, into the camp of the justified doesn't make any sense. And so in the very same year he gives that talk, he also is present and playing a key role at a council which promulgates the dogmatic truth that there's only one baptism for the remission of sins. Therefore, if we want to adopt the premise of the, quote, baptism of desire defenders, that we have to enter the mind of theologians to determine the true meaning of the promulgated text, well, the mind of Gregory Nazianzen, who played a role in the promulgated definition, was that one baptism excludes baptism of desire. Therefore, the actual intention, according to this reasoning, 
of the fathers of the First Council of Constantinople must be considered to be that there's only one baptism to the exclusion of any notion of baptism of desire. And of course, that would fit with the later dogmatic definition of the Council of Vienne in the 14th century, which declared that all Catholics must confess that this one baptism for the remission of sins is of water. So I consider that an interesting point in refutation of the defenders of baptism of desire who falsely argue that rather than being guided by the dogmatic pronouncements, we must enter the mind of the theologians. And that's why all of the arguments they advance, since they're all rooted in faith in man, are all refuted by the word of truth, the dogmatic pronouncements, and a more careful consideration of the facts. Something else that's very interesting is the fact that the Roman breviary says this for May 9th concerning St. Gregory Nazianzen. Quote, In the opinion of learned and holy men, there is nothing to be found in his writings which is not conformable to true piety and Catholic faith, or which anyone could reasonably call in question. End quote. That's a devastating rebuttal to baptism of desire defenders who sometimes make arguments from the Roman breviary. And we've refuted those in the past. For example, one heretical defender of baptism of desire who advances the typically refuted objections, he said some years ago, quote, and of course theologians consider that it is impossible that there should be theological error in the breviary. That was from John Daly. Well, the heretic doesn't realize that advancing that argument destroys his own position on, quote, baptism of desire. That's because the Roman breviary says that the man who clearly and repeatedly rejected baptism of desire, in the opinion of holy men, there is nothing in his writing which is not conformable to Catholic faith or which could reasonably be called into question. It's another example of how whatever argument is advanced for this false doctrine is demolished by a more careful consideration of the facts. That point, by the way, was made in a recent discussion with the heretical so-called priest, James Gordon of the Fraternity of St. Peter, who was defending baptism of desire. And all of these individuals who defend baptism of desire in our day also believe that souls can be saved in false religions, which is a heresy condemned by the church. In addition to Gregory's very clear and repeated rejection of baptism of desire, I wanted to discuss an interesting statement he made about infant baptism. But before I get to that, just think of the dishonesty of the defenders of baptism of desire. Many of them have seen this quote from St. Gregory's oration, and they will still say that the fathers were not only unanimous in favor of baptism of desire, a total lie, but they will say that St. Gregory himself favored baptism of desire. For example, Father Francois Lenay of the Society of St. Pius X wrote an appalling book called Is Fenianism Catholic, which I discuss at length in my salvation book and, frankly, tear to shreds. He says about St. Gregory's quote that, this is from page 67 of his book, one sees here the very principle of baptism of desire. On page 65, he also says, quote, Far from being against, meaning baptism of desire, he, Gregory, rather sets the very principles of baptism of desire, end quote. It's amazing. They're like spiritual zombies. In fact, this Father Linnae said in the same book that the Council of Florence, quote, mentions baptism of desire. A total lie. Mortal sin. He just stated it, even though it's completely untrue. That book has been published by the Society of St. Pius X. It's been sold in who knows how many of their bookstores. And it's probably still sold in many of their bookstores. For those who knowingly promote it, mortal sin, mortal sin, mortal sin. In dealing with these people, you're dealing with devils. That's what they are, devils. There was another heretic who wrote something in favor of, quote, baptism of desire. that contained so many lies and false arguments that one could write a whole book breaking them all down. He also refused a debate challenge, of course. And, for example, to just give one of probably a hundred you could give, he's talking about a quote from St. John Chrysostom, in which St. John Chrysostom clearly says that unbaptized catechumens cannot be saved if they are not joined to the faithful by baptism. And his conclusion is that the quote favors the idea of baptism of desire. 
You're just dealing with dark liars, that's what they are, instruments of the enemy, who are used to justify their own faithlessness and that of others. Now, in regard to infant baptism, in the same oration, Gregory says, quote, what have you to say about those who are still children and conscious neither of the loss nor of the grace? Are we to baptize them too, certainly if any danger presses? For it is better that they should be unconsciously sanctified than that they should depart unsealed and uninitiated. End quote. This quote is interesting because, first, he clearly affirms his belief that infants cannot be saved without baptism. And he does this also in another part of the oration in which he says that people who die in infancy without baptism will not be glorified or saved. In this paragraph, he indicates the same by saying that they will depart unsealed, uninitiated, and unsanctified. But even though he believes infants cannot be saved without water baptism, is he insistent upon baptizing infants immediately after birth? No, he's not. He says in this quote that if any danger presses, they should be baptized right away. But in the next paragraph, he goes on to say that in the case of others, meaning other infants who are not in danger of death, they should be baptized at about the end of the third year. It's true that various practices and customs arose in different parts of the early church, according to which the baptism of infants was sometimes delayed longer than it should have been. The apostolic tradition, as we learn from the Council of Florence and other examples in tradition, is to baptize infants as soon as possible after birth. But in certain parts and at certain times of the early church, the baptism of infants was delayed longer than it should have been. This is also true of the baptism of adults. And the reason this quote is relevant to our topic is because it shows that while he clearly did not believe infants could be saved without water baptism, he was not insistent upon baptizing all infants right away. That shows us that just because there is a delay in baptizing an infant or a delay in baptizing an adult catechumen, it is not indicative of a belief that those people can be saved without water baptism. And this is a clear example of that. He did not believe infants could be saved without water baptism, yet for those who are not in any danger, he recommended waiting until the end of the third year. The reasoning of many of them was, according to predestination, which held that, essentially, if they happened to die without water baptism, they were simply not among the elect. Therefore, this quote is simply another point which refutes the objection that the delay in baptizing adult catechumens, which was observed at different times in the history of the church, was indicative of a belief that those adult catechumens could be saved by their desire for baptism. Not at all. In fact, in our salvation book, we quote Pope St. Siricius, who in the year 385, writing specifically on the law at the time that adult converts were to be baptized at Easter time, he says that if they happened to die before their baptism, even if they desired water baptism, they will not receive the life of the kingdom, meaning salvation, and the only way for them to be saved is to actually receive water baptism. And therefore, if there's any danger of death situation, the priest should not wait until Easter time, but should baptize all the unbaptized catechumens immediately. And by the way, the reason the custom developed to postpone the baptism of adult converts to Easter time is because baptism represents the putting off of the old man, the putting to death of the old man, and the rising to new life in Christ, and that is most appropriately celebrated at the time when the church is recognizing the resurrection. As we read in Romans 6, 4-5, quote, For we are buried together with him by baptism into death, that as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. End quote. The postponement of the baptisms until Easter time was also for the more thorough instruction and testing of the catechumens. However, it must be emphasized that this postponement of adult baptisms at certain times is not a requirement of apostolic tradition, as we see in Acts chapter 8, verse 36, where Philip baptizes the eunuch of Candace after the quickest catechism class in history. He instructs him in the basics, receives a commitment from him, 
and then baptizes him. That's how baptisms should essentially go in our day. Once a person demonstrates a familiarity with the basics, agreement on the essential points of doctrine, a commitment to pray and live the life, then that person should be baptized. There are actually a number of interesting new quotes and points on this topic, which we hope to share soon. They further refute the false idea of, quote, baptism of desire.